Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator you know you would place some implants and why did you why you know before you get started i just want to talk about why do you want to talk about uh, complications so i um you know I, I went through training um residency i graduated back in 2007 you know and when you leave your training program and you have successes there um you never really see what went well but definitely not what didn't go well so then after i was done in my training i actually stayed um, in chicago as a faculty member and then i remember some of the residents coming to tell me about a patient that i treated and telling me what went wrong so when you do actually get to stay in a in one spot for a while you do get to see that oh, this was my error in judgment of, you know, implant location or treatment planning or risk factors or whatever it may be, you know, especially people that have to clean up your mess afterwards, they will tell you all about it. So that became something that I was more in tune with when you get to stay in one place for a while. So now that I'm in Ohio, I've been here now almost nine years. You know, and I see that, um, you know, the patients are definitely coming back, um, not just for recall and, and other needs, but definitely they have a number of complications. So I thought, you know, um, this would be a good opportunity to share a little bit of what we've seen um, and how we kind of got ourselves out of it a little bit um, and definitely there's so many factors in implants that can happen, but I'm a prosthodontist that does a lot of prosthetics. So I thought I'd focus a little bit more on the, the prosthodontic side of complications today and sort of share some of our stories that we came across and what may be you know, common for you in your practice um, and, and so forth. So, and some of the things that, that we were able to do, we, we, we documented it and published it in, in journals. So, you know, it was a good thing for us to share our, our, um, experience with other people, you know, cause whatever, you know, you find something new or you try something new, you want to be able to share it with other people so they can get this, themselves out of those situations as well. Okay. All right. Uh, th thank you so much. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead here. Uh, welcome, welcome to the webinar series today. I see you. Uh, I see you uh, all the way from uh, um, uh, United States, Dr. Osunde. You know, Akideno from Nigeria, from uh, uh, from um, Indonesia. I see someone from Cambodia. I see someone from Nigeria, um, Iraq, uh, from Yemen. Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, truly uh, an international group. Hopefully we can continue to share um, what we, 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 we find, you know, good information. I like the fact that, you know, you publish your findings. Uh, we are, we're privileged to have Dr. Damian Lee today. He's uh, originally from Ann Arbor, Go Blue, <laughs> where he graduated from the University of Michigan with a Bachelor of Science in uh, Movement Science. He received his Doctor of Dental degree uh, from the University of Michigan as well. Uh, upon completion of his dental school, he was trained at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the Advanced Prostodontics Program, uh, where he received a certificate and a master's degree in oral science. Dr. Lee has been in academia since 2007. 2000, that's a long time ago, and is currently director of the Advanced Education and Procedurals Program at the University of uh, Ohio State University 
uh, College of Dentistry. He also maintains a prosthodontic practice at uh, the dental faculty practice at that institution. Dr. Lim, let me please take it away. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Does that look okay? All right. If there's any questions along the way, uh, you can definitely put it on the chat. And I think Ugo, you said we're gonna have some time for questions later, right? Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us. Um, appreciate the time and the opportunity. I, I met Dr. Ugo through uh, mutual friends um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting him in person. We share some other common things like Army Reserve. So I have a lot of questions to ask him later on. But um, I've been at Ohio State for, like I said, almost nine years. Um, Ohio State is very unique in a sense of they have been a clinical trial center for many implant um, companies when implants were being introduced in North America. So um, they came over um, in, in the late 1980s. And since about that time in early 1990s, um, they have been placing implants and restoring them. So they had a clinical trial center here for a long time. So over 25,000 fixtures have been placed and restored. And that was just when I started here. So imagine the number now, it's probably closer to, you know, well past 30,000 implants. So when you do see a lot of fixtures being placed and restored, you also see them coming back with successes and failures. Um, when I first started working here, we used to see, you know, two to three almost every day. And, and we thought, oh my God, did, did we do something terribly wrong as an institution? Why are we getting so many fixtures, you know, per day? And then when we calculated the number of fixtures, maybe two to 3% of, of, of complications happening, and then it made sense, you know, it was, it was within that range of we were seeing the complications occurring in the rate of two to 3% of the fixtures that we put in. And then they were coming back with either minor complications that we were able to take care of that day or major complications where we needed to take things out and, and redo something. So it was a valuable lesson for us and realized that it wasn't actually excessive amount of complications. It was just within that norm. So to us, um, it was something that was very, very um, valuable to learn from and also then how to manage it. Because that's another thing is that sometimes you get these implants that are coming back with problems, but they're no longer around. So when, when you don't have access to companies and representation that you can call and ask, hey, can you send me a new screw for this system? Or can you send me, you know, this um, device for, for a different system? They don't have it anymore, you know, and, and that changes all the time. Um, you know, we use major brands of implants right now, Zimmer, Nobel, um, Astra, and Strawman. But if you understand the, the, the upcoming of the upbringing of those same companies, um, my God, like Nobel BioCare has had numbers of implant lines that appeared and disappeared. And when you try to look for parts for those, it's difficult to find. So for us trying to um, find those solutions, it becomes a challenge and it becomes something that you have to work with your team or your, your staff members and your residents and making sure that, you know, you can provide something for your patient that's gonna last them another good, you know, 10, 15 years if it took that long to see that complication. So um, for us as clinicians, um, implant therapy has been something that has been a great addition to what we do in terms of replacing missing teeth. There's nothing really in medicine that has over 90% survival rate and success rate like a dental implant. So for us, it's a game changer because we can really recreate a tooth that was lost and try to find something that can provide patients with function and, and um, aesthetics all over again. 
And so, you know, we always trying to provide a good sound treatment planning that has the basis from a good restorative plan. Um, implant does no good if it's not restored um, other than just maintaining bone. But again, no one's gonna place an implant just to maintain bone. We want function, we want aesthetics, we want appearance, we want self-confidence all over again. So those are the things that we're looking for. We also realize that it has to go in good bone. So you've seen so much changing happening in time, in terms of the technique that we use to um, find the bone. Um, I think cone beam CT is now pretty much a regular in terms of when you're treatment planning. Um, and then you see people that are also using, utilizing cone beam CT for um, recalls and maintenance as well. You know, we use that uh, once in a while, not on a regular basis because of the amount of radiation, but we definitely utilize it when we do have some complication, trying to see the bone destruction and then the rebuilding of it. But we're looking for bone that is adequate in height and width and with good bone quality so that we know that the implant itself is embedded in good bone overall and also keratinized tissue. So I didn't really, you know, when you're a prosthodontist, you really like just care much about the crown and how things look. And, and, you know, we sort of put tissue to the side because that you feel like it's more perio and so forth. But I didn't realize the importance of keratinized tissue until I started to see changes around implants over, over a period of time. So having good keratinized tissue is going to firm up that implant area and then provide some good lung stability um, in the um, tissue itself. And also with good emergence. Um, trying to recreate emergence that is very conducive to good periodontal health and implant health, I think it creates a lot of good environment for that area to, to stay clean and maintain those bones as well. And then obviously the way that we are designing these crowns with the materials that we're using, they keep changing. Um, you know, we're gonna discuss today from conventional cast material all the way to new polymers even. And those are things that we keep putting, continuing to research. However, the tables are, have turned a little bit where a lot of those materials are being introduced before it has good sound evidence. The laboratory business is the driving force of these materials and they're selling to people what they think is a good material, but we may not necessarily have good research behind some of these things. So for us as academic, academicians, we're definitely trying things out to make sure that these do last or don't last and, and try to make recommendations based on those things as well. And of course, um, you know, my family members have implants, my wife has implants in her mouth, and um, we want them to last as long as possible. Um, you know, they, they're going to come right back to me and say, you said the implants were the best thing, and why did it fail so early? And so those are the things that we are looking to do, what we're striving to do, um, not just the placement, the crown and all those things, but once it's in, in the mouth and you delivered it and you want it to be there for a long time. So when we are in class with our residents, we do something called um, um, knowledge gaps. We, we look for knowledge gaps and we do these um, spider diagrams and see how they all interact with each other. And so when we were looking at um, the spider diagrams for, for complication, this is what we came up with. You can see here what's more biological, but also prosthetic here, and then how that interplays with the, the time factor, whether it's early or if it's after loading or if it's within five years or long-term type of things. And then you're looking at also the risk factor on how those things contribute to those um, complications from occurring. So today we're gonna to try to focus more on the prosthetic and mechanical side here today and discuss some of the complications and the percentage of things that we're dealing with. So we're gonna talk, I'll start talking about complications with a single tooth implant. And then we'll talk a little bit about overdentures and then finish up with uh, full arch fixed implant processes. So when we discuss single tooth implant crown complications, um, I've always enjoyed reading papers from Dr. Goodacre. He is a well-known entity in our prosthodontic literature. 
and also in, in um, academia. And it's great that um, his son, Dr. Brian Vidaker, has also been publishing with him and they've also written very good reviews. So when I was a resident and I was reading Dr. Goodacre's paper, the number one complication was screw listening. And it was even as high as 25%. And those are implants that we were restoring with an abutment screw and a prosthetic screw. So each crown had two screws. Therefore, the number of complications was so high. But now that we've gone to a single um, abutment screw holding things down, whether it's screw retained or cement retained, the number has gone down drastically, which is a good thing. So you'll see that the Obama's screw loosening is as high as 3%. But in this review also, it was surprising to see that implant fracture was as high as 3%. So this was, again, um, this was a compiled um, trials and reviews that they put together uh, from 2011 to 2017. And within that time period, some of the papers that they were using a reported implant fracture there, and it was as high as 3% in that one. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what's contributing to things like that. But also porcelain veneer fracturing, chipping, and those things at 2%. Loss of recent retention or decimentation, this was at 2%. And, and then we also saw that um, the proximal contacts opened up. Um, we've seen various case reports on this and I don't know if you guys are seeing this in your practice as well, but we come, we see patients coming back with open contacts uh, periodically. And, and that's a phenomenon that we um, definitely need to be aware of. And, you know, I used to think that maybe the, some of the other residents before we saw, um, I came here, just made a mistake. I, I thought, oh, wow, you know, some of our people that have trained here in the past made a mistake and, they deliver something with an open contact. And sure enough, um, you know, even our residents and our patients coming back with open contacts was, was um, noted. And so I think, you know, the mouth is always changing the PDL and, and the, the dentition around the implant restorations are, are causing some changes in the mouth where the contacts open up. And then there's any kind of remake uh, and thank God for, having such a low number because this is where a lot of uh, training programs uh, spend a lot of money um, trying to get those um, taken care of. So when we talk about screw loosening, um, it ranges here it's in other reviews as well. Within five years, um, you know, 0.6% to 2%, um, and then it can go higher depending on what type of restoration you're using. Cement retained restoration and screw loosening, again, um, it's that two to three percent range. Um, when I was in Chicago, you know, we used to um, cement these crowns with uh, permanent cement. And so, you know, and we, I always ask them, why do you do that? What happens? Something comes loose. And then the, the answer really was, well, the chances are, you know, two percent where we'll take that chance versus having something decemented uh, where that percentage could be even higher. So, um, instead of something coming off and someone some swallowing something, um, they chose to use permanent cement at that time. I don't know if it's still the case now, um, but um, depending on what you're using, I think you know, you're just trying to use what's best for your patient. And then screw retain restorations, other studies have um, reported a little bit higher um, screw loosening rate, uh, depending on which paper you're reading, but again, in general, I think we've seen more papers that say screw retention has a little bit more screw uh, loosening compared to cement uh, retained restorations. And then also we see that it's a little bit higher maybe for anterior versus posterior. Some other papers have reported something different. Again, I think it's the way that uh, papers are uh, compiled together and so forth. But again, um, depending on whether, you know, it's a, a tooth that has a lot of guidance on it versus something that has a, um, a lot of loading being put on like a molar, regardless of the case, um, you know, occlusions have known to cause um, loosening of parts and early failures of parts if we're not accounting for any kinds of um, interference or um, any kind of premature contact. Um, and again, based on implant restoration and how many there are in the mouth, 
uh, is definitely less uh, de noticeable, detectable on the patient to know that there is a premature contact. And then we've seen fractures of veneering ceramic on a crown. Um, we've seen this happen from whether you're using PFM or any kind of zirconia restorations. There was a point in time where we're using a lot of layer zirconia and we noticed a lot of chipping in those as well. So again, people have been going to using zirconia in the posterior dentition because of its um, high density and high strength. At the same time, we wanted to maximize the aesthetics by layering porcelain on top of that. And that's where we saw a lot of chipping of the veneering ceramic as well. And we briefly talked about decementation, again, based on this review by um, Rampton uh, Sadizade. Um, in Buffalo, what we saw was 6% in 5.2 years. So then we have to go back and seeing, well, what did the abutment design look like? Are you using a prefabricated abutment or a custom abutment? Definitely custom abutments can utilize uh, the retention form and resistance form that you would normally see in a regular crown prep. So that's why many people advocated for using a custom abutment to maximize those a good qualities on the crown. However, the cost is always more expensive for a custom abutment. So um, a lot of people have used um, prefabricated abutments instead. And so um, when you do have a stock abutment, maybe that's not as tall or not as um, the height to bait rate, base ratio may be um, not in the best ratio. Um, usually it's very circular in nature. Um, and when you do have a crown that's sitting on top of those type of abutment, what type of looting agent are you using? Are you using a, um, you know, material that is going to hold that for a long time, or are you using something that is more water sol soluble, like a zinc oxide eugenol, um, where you know, it's commonly used as a temporary material. So this was one patient that we saw, um, and sorry for the, the blurry radiograph, it was um, just a picture that we took, but this was a common phenomenon for this patient. And what we did for this patient at the time was we used a combination of a screw retained uh, crown splinted together to a cement retained crown. And what we saw was that where the cement eventually washed out in this um, distal abutment here, then it became a um, sort of a risk factor for us where the 25 to 40 micron of cement space became this constant moving area where it started to affect the retentive um, torque that was put on for the crown in front of it. So this one was the screw retained one. And eventually what we noticed was it kept on loosening up and then trying to refill this and cement it and screw back in, um, eventually led to the breaking of the screw. Um, so what do you do in a case like that? Do you just go ahead and put a new screw in, maybe use a different looting agent for this distal one and then just put it back on? Or do you redesign the whole thing? When is it that you make a decision. But all, what you also notice is the amount of bone loss that this person is now exhibiting. So then you're thinking, you know, is something from the crown itself that's causing a biological change in the bone itself as well? Or is it something that, um, you know, patient is not able to keep things clean in the posterior and, and um, you know, because the crowns are splinted? You know, it's difficult to say, but when you start having a complication that keeps occurring, you know, then it starts to look a little bit more obvious, like maybe there's something going on with the, the crown itself that may be having some biological detriment, uh, detrimental biological reaction as well. This was another patient that we saw. And you can see here the, the short implant that was put in because of the uh, nerve running underneath it. And the implant went, went in pretty well. And the patient was restored, as you can see here, but patient kept coming back with a loose screw. And, you know, for us, you say, well, it doesn't look that bad, but it's just pretty far away from the, the tooth over here. So then you're thinking, well, how do you, 
um, prevent this from um, getting worse. So some of the papers that we read, this one was out of South Korea. And this one looked at a follow-up study of three years, and they were looking at the horizontal distance from where the implant is placed to the crown in front of it. So you can see here in this um, next slide here, they measured the dimensions from A to B, which is where your implant is placed, all the way to where the tooth is in front. So usually, if you remember from classic article by uh, Dr. Tarnow, you know, you're usually about 1.5 millimeter away from the tooth next to it. So then how do you get the placement like this that's farther away? Uh, when I was in training, when you were, you know, trying to put your first few implants in, kind of get scared of the tooth in front of it. So you kind of shied a little bit more distal. I remember making those mistakes. Um, but at the same time, when you look at a molar site, this is exactly where maybe your distal root um, used to be. You know, when you extract a lower molar and you have two sockets, mesial and distal root, and you decided to put an implant right into that distal root, this is what you would kind of see. So for them, they started to see that out of 183 patients and 221 implants, they saw 40 complications, which is about 18.1%. And then they also noticed that this rate of complication increased when the horizontal distance also went up, okay? And then another thing that from this paper that they noted was 65% of complications occurred within the first six months. So they were able to kind of see um, at least more than half of the complication occur um, in the first six months. And out of those 65, 17 had screw loosening in the first six months. And so when they did their calculation, they saw that maybe it shouldn't exceed 3.7 millimeters from this point of implant placement to the tooth in front. And that was an observation that they made. So maybe then trying to put the implant more in the septum, not in one of those roots may be better. So this patient came back with another loose screw and, and poor resident of ours um, was trying to tighten it and it broke off inside as she was trying to torque it. We were not able to take out the screw at all. And so we ended up removing the implant, um, unfortunately, and replaced it. But this time, because of where the bone is, we placed it a little bit closer to uh, the tooth in front of it. And fortunately for us, we have not seen this patient since that time. So we're thinking that um, the implant has not loosened up. Um, since that time. So um, although it was a negative experience, maybe it turned into a positive, um, but for us so far, it's been okay. So maybe that does, the distance that you see does play a role in how that goes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, cement retained uh, restorations. Uh, this was a picture from my friend in Illinois, Chicago, Dr. Chapocho. And he sent me this when we were trying to put together a uh, list of complications in different um, institutions. And you can see clearly here, the remnants of the cement uh, that's left behind here. So, you know, how do you control your cement? What is your go-to method and so forth? Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Chandra Wadmani when we were hosting him in our local prosthodontic conference here in, in Columbus, Ohio, um, Boucher Conference. And, um, he had spent our early part of his uh, lecturing on controlling cements. So you'll see a lot of good papers that he's written about uh, the understanding of uh, fluid dynamics and the hydraulic pressures and how we notice the behavior of the cement as they get being seated. So the speed of how you are seating those crowns and how you see the extrusion of those uh, excess cement um, being deposited around those implants. And of course, the biological consequences of those cement um, over time. And we've seen a very destructive uh, um, peri-implantitis occur when cement gets left behind. So while, you know, I think early 2000s, we saw a good amount of cement retention happening. Now we see the rise of pure retention definitely because of the destructive nature of excess cement. So controlling the cement 
whichever uh, method you decide to use, whether you're painting it on, where you're just putting it on the, um, the margin itself or other methods, um, which we'll share later, um, you know, excess cement really needs to be accounted for. So then this was sent uh, after that it was cleaned up, but also what you can faintly see right here where I have a circle is that you're still left. So there's some right here and right there, right? So we got rid of the cement right at the margin area, but what you also see is excess cement in this area. So I would hate to be this patient or um, the, the faculty covering that day when patient comes in with excess amount of cement and you have to remove it and then notice that you have all this uh, cement left behind. Dr. Wadmani also published another paper uh, making a little bit of a what a little um, intaglio, the, the analog of the abutment itself through um, making um, a replica with a bite registration material with some Teflon tape and then controlling the excess amount of cement first and then seeding it onto the implant itself. So this was um, published um, back in 2009, uh, an older paper, but especially now it is, it is still very applicable with materials that are, that are very easily found. And this was another one that talked about um, the analysis of the cement and, and the, um, how much of the cement stays on to the crown itself and controlling the weight of the cement versus um, the technique that they're using. So gross application, as you can see here, versus brushing it on versus marginal application here. So again, more you put in does not necessarily mean that it's more retentive. You don't really need that much cement, again, because the implant crown. So depending on your lab and what they use for the offset to make those crowns, how much uh, cement you put on really makes a big difference. And again, you know, less is more in this sense. These are some other, pa other patient um, slides that we've seen where we have, um, you know, crowns that are not fully seated. This one here, you can definitely see the excess amount of cement that was um, exhibited here. And also the biological consequences, especially any kind of perimucositis or implantitis that occurs here. This is one of the patients that we saw where you see a fixed partial denture. Um, and maybe these are some of the radiopaque um, nature of the excess cement that got left behind somewhere. Um, and then, Again, same patient had both of these, and you can see here fully, very, very big. It must be at least millimeter and a half to two millimeters of, of a marginal gap opening here uh, for this crown, even with a open contact on the mesial. So we called this dentist up and said, hey, you know, we see this problem, can you fix it? And the dentist didn't feel like it was going to be a problem because it's an implant and not a tooth. So having an open margin on an implant is not a problem. And I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but obviously for us, we didn't agree with it. And so we said, told the patient to go back to the dentist and get it fixed before we can do any rehab. Another method that um, controlling cement we can do is to cement it outside. And this was a paper that was published with our own um, OSU former OSU faculty, Dr. McGlunphy. Um, and this was called a combined implant crown when it was first introduced in 1992. It was a publishing compendium, you know, and um, it was something that a screw retention had an access. So if you wanted to unscrew it, um, and, and you can make the, um, the crown itself with a custom abutment first, cement it, and make a hole and put the screw through that to make it into a retrievable cement again. Um, nowadays, we see a lot of this happening where um, you can mill the titanium abutment and customize it to what you wanted. You can maximize the retentive features on the crown itself, cement it outside, control all the um, amount of cement and then screw it in the mouth to put it back on. Only thing you have to be careful is that the way that the cement will, sorry, the, the way that the crown will sit on the implant abutment 
may not be the same axis that the implant itself goes into the, the restoration goes into the implant. So if your tooth is tilted like this, but your implant is placed this way, right? This, the crown will need to go in this way, but your axis of seating it may only get you about this way here. So you do have to see the neighboring teeth and then you would have to adjust the, the contour of the neighboring teeth accordingly to make it into a screwmentable. So that's something that you have to account for. So this was an interesting case um, that we saw. Um, Dr. Yilmaz and, and Dr. Mascarenas uh, are former faculty and resident at OSU. Saw a patient one day, I remember because I was in, in, in the office next to the clinic, um, said patient came in with a loose crown. He said, okay, we thought maybe it was a tooth, maybe a broken post and core. And then we realized that the patient had this implant that was just cemented onto an implant. So you don't see obviously the abutments here, patient had this implant placed and whatever the reason it was, the dentist decided to make a post and core pattern and just, just cemented like a regular post and core. So we retrieved the crown itself to see what was going on with the implant. And then we noticed that um, implant was still healthy. So we actually had a retapping tool um, and we use this to clean up the excess cement inside and retrap the whole thing. And once we have done that, then we have uh, tried uh, to see a impression coping. And then based on that, we were able to then put a new custom abutment inside and then go ahead and restore the new one. So um, again, just getting self yourself out of the situation and help the patient and maybe not get a new implant um, it can be very helpful as well. So those are some of the things we've done. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about abutment complication because that's something that we come across. Um, and we've been sort of evolving in a sense of what type of abutment we have been using for patients and so forth. So when I was in training, again, we used to wax these by hand, cast it in metal, and then you know put a crown on top of it. And then thank goodness for, you know, CAD CAM technology. Now we can customize our implant abutments in titanium and zirconia, but also have something together. And we'll talk about why uh, the tie bases became more popular because what you see here in this table is that zirconia in, it, in its own is very, very strong and dense, right? So it's very hard compared to titanium alloy or commercially pure titanium. It's much, much denser and harder. And so when you have zirconia sitting up against the titanium implant, any kind of fretting movement, any kind of movement that causes friction can then start to wear down the titanium. So that's what we saw, especially after cyclic loading. Other studies have been um, documented. Uh, this one was out of um, Yukon. Uh, and this is when we noticed that titanium can wear off and leave a residue on the zirconia implant abutment. And this was also um, published in other papers as well. And of course it happened to us as well. And we wrote a paper about it. And so this patient uh, was seen in our clinic. Um, I think this was before I was working here. So had been some time. Uh, she was missing a uh, central incisor, number eight. And then this is what it looked like. So this is what the patient looked like at the time of implant placement. And you see here a little bit of uh, vertical overlap here, horizontal overlap and so forth. But again, um, as long as you can bury the implant, then you would have enough restored space, right? But usually you're looking for about six millimeter of space for you to restore. So whether this was a little bit of, um, of fighting for space, you know, but again, as long as you're placing it deep, then you can have enough uh, height for your, your abutment and crown. So this is what she presented with at the time of placement. And this is how the implant was placed. So you can see here, here's your CEJ and it was well below that. And so you can see here that, you know, did it get too close to the, the tooth next to it? I don't know, it was just a PA uh, with the tooth, you know, um, but 
custom abutment in zirconia was made, and then a old ceramic crown was put on top. And the patient comes back and had repeated loosening. So then we're wondering what's going on. Is it the occlusion? Is it just the overlap that was causing this to loosen up? What was going on? But it kept on loosening up. We tightened it and then we didn't see her for a while. And then she came back and she said, it's too, too loose again. Can you please take a look? So then this time we took the whole thing off and we looked at it and we saw a lot of titanium residue. And then when we tried to re-impress the, the crown, because we saw the wear and we decided, okay, let's go ahead and make a new crown. And you can see here a good amount of wear here and then all the titanium residue. So then uh, when we put in the impression coping, it wasn't seating. Um, let me rephrase that. It was seated, but it was still jiggling. So we thought that it's not gonna work out what's going on with the implant. And, and then later on, the implant actually failed. So we had an opportunity to put the implant itself into a uh, scanning electron microscope and saw that all this wear had happened inside the implant compared to something that's a brand new implant. So this was an implant analog, no, sorry, a brand new implant. And this one was a, implant that was, so the, the failed implant that had the loose crown for many years. We can see the amount of destruction that zirconia can occur on the implant itself. So before the implant failed, we took a comb beam and we saw that not only was it a little bit distally placed, it was too buckly placed. You can see that all the buckle plate had gone. So we were able to um, graft the bone again, let it heal, and then put a new implant in. This was the implant with a provisional before we took the other crown off to make it more uh, symmetrical. Uh, we put a gold hue abutment in, which is a titanium, anodized titanium abutment. And then we put two uh, new crowns on there to make uh, an aesthetic outcome here. Uh, we haven't seen the, seen the patient since, so we're assuming that she's doing okay. Um, they do come in for, and when I say we haven't seen the patient, is as it's uh, for any kind of complication. They do come in for periodic um, recalls and exams and so forth too. So. Uh, a bone fracture is not as common, but it does happen. And we've seen it in other kinds of material. And when we usually see a bone fracturing like this, uh, usually this piece is inside the implant and trying to get this out is very difficult because Sometimes this is already out, this is inside the implant and the, the gingiva has grown over that area. So you have to go ahead and use a tissue punch or, or use a blade to, to flap it and then try to get this piece out. So again, we went through that and we were able to write a paper. Um, so this one was a method that we used a plastic periodontal probe and we modified that actual probe to make it into a retrieval tool. So if you didn't have something that can fit right through that hexagon and try to get it out, that's something you can use as well. So this patient actually had a fractured zirconia abutment that was lodged inside and we had trouble taking this out, out of the mouth. So what we did was we used a periodontal probe, took a little um, hand piece and, and modified it. And then this part went into that hex and then you will kind of shake it a little, try to loosen that up and then, and then pull it out that way. If you need to adjust more to engage more of the shank of the periodontal probe, you can modify it more as you see fit. Um, it's an easy method to use. Most of the time your office will have a plastic perio probe. Um, just let your hygienist know about it so that she doesn't go looking for it. Um, and then you'll probably have to buy a new one. But again, if you didn't have access to all these implant retrieval tools, then that's something that you can use. So again, you can see here, retrieve part here. And what do you see? You see titanium residue, right? So, um, you know, maybe good thing that it did happen. I don't know, but we were able to reuse um, that implant and restore it. So you can see here, um, 
So I don't know how many companies are still using a full um, zirconia abutment of that nature, but um, we started using a titanium base. So here, uh, the titanium base gets cemented onto a milled zirconia crown and it, the surfaces are treated. I think they're acid etched and then bonded with uh, resin cement like Panavia. So through the years, um, we went through of trying to find the right formula of the offset for milling the crown, the height of the tie base and what that should be um, so that you can have good amount of height to it. Um, in the earlier versions of this crown, we had a lot of issues because it would decement right at this junction. So the crown would come off and then the patient would come back with the tie base lodged in the mouth. So again, it was very similar to as if you were using a stock abutment that is too low and too narrow in terms of the abutment design and whatever you cemented on was just coming off. So we had an opportunity to document this and wrote a paper. So here you can see the dislodged crown here and the tie um, base that's still in here. Um, and then you would unscrew the, the, remove the screw, but the tie base itself wouldn't come out. So this time we were actually um, fortunate to have a, a retrieval kit. So this was Salvin, that's the name of the company. Um, and I don't have any ties to any companies. I don't make money off of companies. So there's no conflict of interest here, but we were able to use one of these tools. Uh, this tool actually is what they call to remove a fixture. So if you had a failing implant and you can use this and try to detorque it and remove it, but we actually use that tool to engage the implant part itself. And then we were able to retrieve it out and then um, go here. So, um, you know, trying to just utilize whatever tools you have to, to retrieve these things are, are valuable. Um, and so when you look at sort of the decision-making, um, you know, how do you decide um, what you should be doing when it's broken screws, broken parts or whatever. And our former resident and faculty member, Ryan, Ferris and Barack wrote this paper um, where you were making these decisions in a flowchart. So can it be visualized? Yes. Can you use a uh, instrument to rotate the screw out? Yes. Was it retrieved? Yes. Can you make another one off of it? Yes. And there you go. There's a new, new um, implant crown. But if you can't, then what can you use? Can you use an ultrasonic scaler? Can you modify an instrument? Can you go ahead and start um, modifying the screw itself to retrieve all of that. So this was a good decision-making tree to go in trying to retrieve things. One thing that I learned um, in, in my time here is that uh, usual, us, using magnification is, is a must uh, for me. Um, so, you know, now I am a proud owner of a 4.5 magnification loops uh, because implant parts are very small and they're difficult to see and trying to get best, best visualization really helps a lot rather than trying to use naked eye or even a you know, two times magnification. So you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of big loops and, and getting a good visual on what I can see to retrieve these parts. So we'll talk a little bit about implant fracture. Uh, again, um, from the reviews that we saw, we saw 3% from the Goodacre review, but the previous um, Dr. Charles Goodacre paper, they mentioned this as one of the least most common complications. So what has changed? What has changed in our implant design? What has changed in our implant material um, that we see a little bit more implant fracture happening on our, um, on our patients? So here you can see this um, fixed partial denture, and again, if you take a, a, a quick look, a cursory look on this, you may not necessarily see this right away, uh, depending on the elation, but definitely with the prosthesis off, 
we were able to see that this implant was fractured. And this actually was a misuse of a narrow diameter implant in the posterior segment. So when you start placing implants that are narrower in diameter, like 3.0 or below, they're really indicated for the anterior or um, lateral incisors, mandibular incisors, and so forth. But they obviously should not be used as an alternative to grafting the site. And this was misused in a posterior region holding a fixed partial denture when it really was not indicated for that. Therefore, it was not able to withstand the load that it was generating. And then you saw the fracture there. This was another example of a vertical fracture that we saw. Um, and usually it's accompanied by a lot of bone loss or and, and loss of tissue and so forth. And unfortunately on the same patient on the contralateral side, we saw similar fracture occurring as well. It's not just fractured vertically, but also you see that it's um, horizontally fractured, right? So you can kind of see maybe some of these off uh, loading axis, maybe some of the um, horizontal movement in, um, induced on the implant itself is making these um, come off and so forth. Some of the other implants that we saw in school was not just not a vertical fracture, but you saw a fracture occurring at the top portion of the implant itself. So you may not see it right away, but when you take the implant off and you saw how it sits on top um, in the bone itself, you saw an altered surface, the mating surface was different. And we saw that right at the lip of where the prosthesis sit. So we did see some of that as well, but luckily it was not very high, much lower than 3% in our school. Thank goodness for that. Um, and we were able to just go ahead and put a new implant in. Some of the things that can happen from poor placement, should this be considered an, um, a complication, uh, it becomes a complication when they are not providing good sound biological um, healing or responses that are supposed to occur around the implants or lack of access um, and so forth, but access to hygiene, but even the bone from filling in properly. Uh, in this case here, you can see the, the implants being placed too close at an angle. Um, you can see that when you even put in the abutment and the crown, there's really no room for anything. So what do you do in a case like this, especially when it's fully integrated and so forth? Do you try to, you know, in this case, same thing here, I would have tried the same thing with custom abutments and trying to make a crown that maybe has metal contact on the distal here and then, um, or the mesial of the molar and then try to put it in. Only thing is along uh, time goes on and you see that it's collecting calculus and also then it's losing a lot of bone. So for this patient, the both of the implants ended up failing and we replaced it. What about some of these patients here where you see implants placed in the very wrong position? What happens to the loading condition of these type of implants? And also how do you restore something like this? Do you just take this out and then restore one giant molar? Or do you try to still make two implants here but have very non-optimal loading condition of these crowns and so forth. I think we ended up taking both of these out and do the fixed partial denture. This one here, you can see how buckly it placed. And also um, in the comb beam, you can see um, the, the lack of bone there too as well. Some of these implants and the grafting can also have a biological toll. And this was one interesting case that we saw where we had a failed graft situation, a black graft was done on a missing canine, and then um, the graft itself failed. And then you can see here that the tooth became symptomatic uh, during the grafting. So a root canal was done. And then also you can see here the amount of bone that we lost when the graft did not work. So we ended up um, taking the lateral incisor out here and then um, putting an implant in for that position. So this is what we saw after the implant was placed. 
So when we're trying to restore someone and trying to treatment plan, um, does not always translate to what you want to do with your patient and the surgeon. So what happens then is you see how challenging it can be when your outline of the restoration was that, but the implants are not in that realm. So what type of material do you use? How do you design your prosthesis? Also, how do you design your prosthesis when you have such a big amount of um, tissue loss? So we see that the defect is quite apparent here in the soft tissue and the bone that we lost, but also we noticed that the patient's teeth shifted. So that was another complication that we saw that we were not expecting. So then now you have to bring in your orthodontic colleague and try to straighten things out, try to um, do a limited um, ortho to push those, but also try to use something that can create, um, mask the defect itself. So this one was a porcelain fused to metal frame that we were trying in, trying to see what type of soft tissue contour we want and so forth. This is what it looked like as we were going back and forth with the lab and trying to make it a little less bulky and more um, tooth-like and so forth. And then nice thing about um, metal ceramic is that you can extend the framework in metal and have the rigidity you need, but also at the same time, enhance the aesthetics and, and the nice thing of pink porcelain and so forth. So um, we were able to get ourselves out of that. And now we'll move on to implant overdentures and its complications. Um, some of the papers that we read in, um, in literature, 2010, Andrea Otelli did a systematic review of of publications from 1980 to 2008. And out of 18 manuscripts that were um, reviewed, you saw um, success rates of 75% um, survival and success rate. And then you saw more, uh, the higher overdenture survival uh, in 10 years for the mandibular arch. Also in the same paper, you also saw the technical complications where you have wear of the retentive elements at 30%, and then also replacing in, um, the ring on a, on a ball attachment at 30%. Also, you notice that rebasing and relining of overdenture at 19%, fracturing of the retentive element or the superstructure, 70%, and then overdenture fracturing completely at 12%, and then more with the attachment screws, abutment screws, and then implant and abutment fracturing at a much lower rate. So again, everything that had to do with the attachment system seemed to wear down much faster and so forth. And then we also saw in other papers that you can definitely re, um, lose the um, inserts and the retention in a very fast rate. So uh, some of these other papers showed that 50% um, of the inserts were replaced in the first year. And definitely what we saw is in vitro outcomes, lab studies that talk about the retentive elements and how strong they are, they did not necessarily translate into what you see in the mouth. So if some company advertises saying our parts can last this much, you know, this long, we definitely didn't see that in the mouth as well. And also what we saw was the wearing of the abutment. So F abutments, which is made of titanium and it sits against the nylon sleeves can definitely wear down. So this is what we saw in our patient pool where we also then wrote a paper because this one, we saw a ball abutment coming back with a very worn down abutment itself. You can see here in the mouth, um, it's worn down to where it looks like a cone. And you can see the, the wear that has happened here. So this used to be a cylinder, but now it's worn down. But the complicated process for this one was that this was an implant that was no longer made. So it was very difficult to find parts uh, to replace these parts. So what we ended up doing was we then sectioned this. Um, this was where the uh, section was. And then we then 
took locator parts and then laser welded it to the old abutment itself. So then again, we modified the abutment to put new attachment systems. And then we were able to put that in the patient's mouth again and reuse those implants. So we're able to utilize um, laser welding to put these titanium parts together and then, so, and then try to reuse the implants themselves. Um, and it worked out for this patient. And, and then again, we came across another situation where um, we had to use this laser welding technology for another patient. This one was a fixed complete denture patient that had lost the distal end of their um, hybrid. And so the old fashioned metal ceramic, uh, metal acrylic type of fixed complete denture. And you can see here the, the old, um, I think this is um, Omnilock system or uh, spline, I forget, but one of those two. But you can see here that the segment broke off. And a lot of the times when we see frame, uh, the old substructure fracturing, it's usually at the spot where they have done some sort of, sort of soldering. So that's where we suspected that the solder occurred. But also at the same time, this patient was part of a research study and patient you know, did not pay for the original processes. So when we told how much the new processes would cost, patient was not able to afford it again. So which, um, then we decided, okay, let's do a overdenture. Then when we start to try in the overdenture parts, this one here, you can see at the very distal was too low compared to the surrounding tissue. So we thought that this would continue to irritate the tissue. So we didn't know what to do because that was the tallest one that the company made. So we made an impression. You can see here that it still needs to be much taller than what this one shows. So we use the same welding technology and then we use um, new uh, locators to make everything much longer. So you can see here that now these parts are well above the tissue and it'll create good soft tissue architecture for this patient to utilize a, um, an overdenture instead of the fixed complete denture that this person had. So here we put in a healing abutment, we buried this one, and then this person used an overdenture. So for this patient, we reported again, um, we had a screw that fractured and then we tried to retrieve it, but it was not a very good retrieval. So um, we actually tried to utilize our endodontic colleague and see if whether they can, you know, because they're using a uh, microscope, uh, maybe they can visualize it better and so forth. But then when you saw the patient coming back, and you saw the amount of um, instrumentation that was done inside the implant, we couldn't use that, right? So this was for an overdenture patient and, and we thought maybe we can try to, you know, reuse those implants again. Um, so we ended up making a pattern. Um, there are castable um, overdenture parts. And so we made a conventional, you know, impression that can maybe um, use it like a post and core. So we did this and then we cemented this in the mouth and then patient was able to use it. So, um, so again, we were able to get the patient out of a jam. Um, I can't remember if this lasted or not, to be honest. Um, I think after a few years, this ended up coming back out and I can't remember whether we re-cemented and kept reusing the denture or we took the implant out and put a new one in. So, but anyhow, um, we do see the need for reline in our overdenture patients. We do see that there's a high risk of ridge resorption that takes place because now your overdenture acts more like what we saw in a combination syndrome where when patient had upper denture and lower anterior dentition on a RPD, distal extension RPD. So we did see more flabby ridge 
from the anterior maxilla, um, the ridge resorption happening in the posterior ridge. And so we do see the need for realign and also checking contact and so forth. We do see denture fracturing and the abutments and implant fracturing. But this common, this is a common phenomenon for lower overdenture, um, especially when you're not accounting for the space that you need to remove at the time of implant placement. A lot of the times, you know, your, pa your, your patient may have um, teeth exactly where you took it out and you're putting implants right on those spots and not accounting for the space that you will need for the abutment and the housing and where the teeth are gonna go. So that does happen uh, more common than not. And in those cases, we're putting something on top that can use it, be used as a mesh or any type of fiber um, mesh that can be reinforced to put those dentures together. I've seen polymers being used as a uh, denture substrate uh, material and so forth. So those are all good things hopefully that we can do, but probably the best thing could be just reducing the bone and having some space. And these are some of the other complications that we saw with a bar overdenture. A uh, bar overdenture, not as common as these solitary abutment overdentures these days, um, but we do see them from time to time. And these are some of the complications that we saw where we saw a good amount of hyperplasia in the mucosa, uh, the replacement of these clips. Because it's a bar, there's much more space. And then because of the space, you do see these uh, other complications happening. Another observation that I made with um, bar overdenture was that they have a lot of patients where the bar is engaging the implant directly, right? So there's no transitional abutment like a multi-base unit or multi-unit abutment. So um, these bars are going straight to the implant. When you try to make parts that go straight to the implant, you do have a lot of angle angulation issues. Um, so trying to fix those angulations and try to get something that's passively seating, you're going to be sectioning and soldering. So what we saw is the, the bars fracture at the solder joint, or maybe the cantilever that you were able to wax into your bar is, is excessive and other things. So now a good thing about CAD CAM is that you can mill something. At the same time, it, I personal opinion is that it's still much easier to um, use a multi-unit abutment and bring things up to the tissue level and that makes it much uh, easier to work with and also much easier for you to fabricate the, the prosthesis um, rather than you know, trying to go straight to the implant, even if you're using CAD CAM technology. So I think it's just utilizing your tools and technology to make things as much uh, easy for you as a clinician, but also for the patient to maintain everything as well. So we'll discuss a little bit about our uh, fixed uh, implant prosthesis. This will be the last section. Um, I hope I'm not going too long here, but um, you can stop me anytime. I'll try to go a little faster. Uh, when we use our metal acrylic uh, type of prosthesis, we saw a lot of broken teeth. A lot of denture teeth started breaking. Uh, they start to wear. And then so we thought the zirconia would be the answer. So then we started using zirconia and try to make it pretty. Rather than monolithic, we put a lot of porcelain on top and those started chipping and so forth. So then your framework breaks and then your prosthesis remake also occurs and so forth. So this is quite common uh, in a lot of prosthetic programs and also in practices, you'll see. But staining of these teeth, broken down teeth, wearing of these teeth was quite common here. This patient had the same uh, tooth break multiple times, but also you see the same patient here with a broken tooth back in the posterior region. And then you start to see the, uh, the wearing of these teeth, especially when you're opposing either natural dentition or another fixed complete denture. So for us, we tried to manage these patients by utilizing either different materials, different design or in, in the overall. Uh, mill dentures have been utilized quite often in prosthetics now. Uh, just the nature of the um, acrylic, the pollen, the PMMA that's manufactured itself has all these good qualities that can uh, make the teeth last longer. 
and they don't, and then because of the monolithic nature of that, um, with the white and the pink together, and it can be milled as a retreading thing. So for this patient that had multiple uh, tooth fracture, we removed the bar, burned the teeth off, and sent it to the company to get it milled on top as a retreading um, while utilizing the same um, substructure that the patient had. So we were able to recreate the design and have this milled and then put on top of the same frame. So patient here um, can then get another life out of these teeth. Um, and then the patient can use this. Um, and then also nice thing about these teeth is that they will be archived at the company. So if this patient wears this down over a long period of time, and then um, we need a new set, they would just have the, the CAD CAM file uh, ready and then just be able to remill it. But the thing about companies is that a lot of these files also take up space. So you have to be careful with the digital files and your companies that you work with. Um, bigger companies obviously may have more pocket or bigger hard drives, so they can keep it longer. Whereas you know some of your local labs might tell you, no, we just delete it all the time. So don't assume that they have your files at hand when it's time for a remake. So that's one thing we saw. The same patient that with a repeated uh, tooth fracture, we decided to go ahead and make a new process, uh, hand waxed um, prototype here, try it in the mouth, make sure patient likes it. And then this was then copy milled into zirconia and then the, with the right technician and right hands, then you get a very um, aesthetic results with a monolithic zirconia. Here, very happy patient noted here. Some of the new patients that we're seeing now, we are no longer doing any kind of metal uh, acrylic type uh, of prosthesis anymore. And we are using more of these uh, fiber reinforced resin as a substructure along with the nano ceramic teeth on top. So these, um, so these are the trade names of Trilor and Trinia, but they are all these um, multi-directional fiber that are interlacing on top of each other. And these provide good strength up to 540 uh, megapascals of flexural strength and also uh, compressive strength as well. Interesting thing about this material, it has a 2% tensile elongation and also has a flexural modulus of 26 gigapascal. So what does that mean for us? Does that mean that you know, it can absorb a little bit more shock um, can it kind of, you know, move just microscopically with the jaw moving? Because uh, there was always questions about, you know, can you use, you know, full zirconia restoration on the mandible when the mandible is flexing? You know, and is it just going to be too dense and overpower that movement? The nanoceramic itself is 30% polymer, 70% ceramic. It's much lighter than the zirconia and it's much stronger than acrylic. So we thought maybe this is a good in-between material, but also the company advertises that it can absorb these shots. So we use them for our patient. You can see here very aesthetic um, outcome here. And then this is what the substructure looks like here. Um, really nothing to, to uh, mask, no gray to mask like we did before. And then, so this then can be easily repaired if you needed to repair anything, um, you know, and then it can be very good with the shade and the aesthetic. Some of the other outcomes that we saw was breaking of the prosthetic screws. So you see here, these are old um, Omnilock or spline systems. They use very similar um, abutments. And then these, if you can visualize it, you can easily retrieve these with a, a sharp instrument um, and then put new screws in, right? But is it always just putting new screws in that makes your day better? What if the patient comes back and then you have the same issues again, but you, this time you're not able to retrieve those? So then we have to kind of look at the AP spread. Uh, this, the patient I just showed you 
the implants are very much in a straight line. So do a, does AP spread really um, have a big influence on the longevity of these um, prosthetic screws? So when we calculate AP spread, we go from the center of the most anterior implant all the way to the most distal part of the posterior implants. And then from that calculation, then you're coming up with a suggestion of 1.5 times that spread and trying to stay within that range. And when you read literature, a lot of them can suggest maybe 15 to 20 millimeters in range. And then um, most of the time, if you're placing your implants between the two foramen, then it's going to be about first molar occlusion. But at the same time, is that the right range that we are, um, are we extending it too far even with 15 to 20 millimeter range? Um, or what if you have a patient that has a very straight and a very um, short AP spread, and then your cantilever then needs to go further than that and exceed the one and a half times that was suggested. So <clears throat> uh, Dr. Drago wrote some papers on suggestions of, in his practice, what was a good um, observation when he saw less complication in the repairs and the, and the um, survival of the prosthesis. So for an interim prosthesis versus a final prosthesis, when the AP spread and the cantilever, sorry, I'll start over, cantilever length and the AP spread ratio, so if you had a one-to-one, -one, um, based on the English suggestion of um, 1.5 times, then the cantilever length would be longer than your AP spread. But when your cantilever length was much shorter, right, so not exceeding too much, a, uh, 0.85 to 0.9 to the AP spread, then they saw a lot of success here. So you don't want to go too far. Maybe keeping it shorter is a better idea. And when it was even lower for an interim prosthesis, when you are doing immediate loading and doing conversion of that um, process denture for your conversion prosthesis, having it much shorter um, was better. Then when it exceeded it, then you had about 17% um, had uh, at least one repair uh, based on their study. Some other options that we see in zirconia are, again, having some kind of a titanium substructure inside or going to a tie base or even going full zirconia here and which one gives us the best success. We don't know yet because the designs really are what the lab technicians are doing. Uh, this was one of our patients that we saw where we saw a chipping around the zirconia with the tie bases. All of the tie bases stayed in the mouth, but the zirconia de-cemented. So we had to remove it and re-cement it again. But can you repair this or does this require a remake? Uh, some of our other designs that we use um, utilize the substructure, titanium substructure, and an onlay uh, zirconia that sit on top of it. And based on some of our uh, previous research, some of the L-shaped or the I-shaped had the best uh, support for a metal uh, acrylic type of prosthesis. But how does this work for a zirconia? Can you still apply that same logic to this type of prosthesis as well? But uh, we've used that when we were a little less in the space and we were worried about um, zirconia monolithic processes breaking. So we decided let's try using a substructure. So after the setup, we can then use the substructure um, design here. And then the zirconia part then is overlaid, cemented, and then returned into the patient's mouth. And this is what that looks like. So we'll see. Um, again, you know, if we are doing the right thing for us by utilizing different designs and everything. But the material itself is definitely much better in terms of the complete denture from what we used to use in the, the denture teeth and so forth. So hopefully we're doing the right things to provide longevity and, and function for our patients. Uh, I wanna thank Dr. Uvo for providing this forum opportunity to share some time with you. And again, if there's any questions, I'll take those now.
Any questions? Do you have any questions? Uh, I guess for, for no questions for right now. Well, okay. I'm sure, you know, as, uh, I'm going to put this, it's going to be available for people to go back and, you know, review it. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get um, some more questions as that. But, but thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for sharing your weekend with us. And um, yes, okay. Great lectures, folks from Iraq, from Nigeria, Cambodia. Thank you guys for, for showing up today and um, looking forward to uh, another time. Uh, next weekend. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I really appreciate Thank you. this. Have a good one. Okay, then. Take care, everyone.